have multiple Paul Harris fellows. I've only got one, and I've got no. I was about to become president when I resigned. So, it's a long story, right? <laughs> it's a long story, yeah. Okay, so right. without further ado, I'm going to give you Professor Amilkar. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. <laughs> it's a crazy world, you know. I mean, I am right now dealing with friends and um, students and colleagues in Florida, and I have to tell them, no, 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 it's winter time. And they say, what the hell? I have to say, and, and it's basically tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So if I am here today, my friends are yesterday. <laughs> okay, so, although that's my resume, but I wanted to start, by the way, how much time I have, sir? You have the usual 50 minutes uh, okay, of questions. And we can... I'm, I'm aiming to go through some of the material a little bit faster. The material is available. And I decided to leave it because it might work as a good reference, but I don't have to keep talking on it. I mean, it's a senior audience. And we're, we're noticing that you're saying faster. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to make myself understood. And uh, the contents is only one aspect of this presentation. The other is to connect with all of you to find out what you are doing and to tell you what I am doing. And, uh, you know, uh, Professor Ajitya Ghosh is a friend of mine for almost 20 years. And um, I have known the family as well. And um, every time I come here, I'm connected with him. And I say, you know, I'm going to make a trip to Wollongong. And he says, come along and share your thoughts. Some of you might have seen me earlier as well. Possibly you have seen me before. So I do enjoy uh, this activity. So this is my pitch for today that uh, most of the work around carbon footprint is, I shouldn't say most of it, but still a significant part is if it is not happening here, it's not happening. So, you know, if I am uh, presenting this on zoom for example then i will say i saved all the carbon of driving uh, down to Wollongong. so here i am thinking i'm burning uh, fuel and uh, here i'm thinking i'm nice neat and clean <coughs> the reality is that every few google searches this is an interesting trivia question there's a correlation between boiling a pot of water for making tea or coffee and doing Google searches. So roughly 10, maybe 15 Google searches is equivalent of boiling a pot of water. And we never correlate the two. If you ask me how many searches I do, I do searches all the time. Of course, I know now building six, but otherwise I would have searched for building six. <laughs> And my daughter, who is an alumni of uh, UW, knew exactly where to drop me off. And I said, why don't you come and listen to my talk? So I said, Dad, it's boring. <laughs> I'm going to go and meet my friend. <coughs> so if you find my talk boring, you're not alone. <laughs> so the idea for us as thinkers, researchers, is to actually look at the holistic picture. I mean, if we have a carbon exchange like we have for you know currency exchange and uh, stock exchange then we are not actually solving the challenge or reducing the footprint what we are saying is i am a company i have saved 100 tons and i am going to sell it to aditya's company which needs 100 tons credit and i will sell it at a premium and I mean, we were talking about travel. You know, Qantas, you can buy $3.95 worth of carbon offset, which is not exactly the idea. So that's that's the thesis, really, of what, what we are talking about. And the battery is running low. Is that a message to me, sir? <laughs> you wind up. Anyway, it, it, it said that just now, so. Is that a power supply or not? 
So just a little bit uh, about myself. I am at Boomer College of Business at University of South Florida. Um, and I've been there now for seven years. But before that, I'm from Australia. I've been here since 1986. My kids are born, brought up here, and so on. Uh, my guru was Professor Brian Hexen Sellers, who is now retired. He was a, he's a uh, max PhD from Oxford. So a, I'm very proud of my PhD, very proud. <laughs> I do a lot of writing. Um, I just enjoy writing, mm -hmm. although my dean is saying, stop writing, start publishing. And Professor Miller and I, we had a brief chat, you know, reviews, um, journal articles, you know, all of that is now highly valued. And out of these eight, seven are from Australia, one from India, none from the US right now. And yeah, I do a bit of reading work. <coughs> and these are just uh, some of my books, which are all freely available to my students, by the way. But, sir, did I give this to you last time? Not I hope yet, not yet. Not <laughs> we, shall, <laughs> okay. we shall make it happen. <laughs> Okay, so big data strategies, art of agile practice. It took me a while to insert the word art in an engineering book. My publisher was saying, why do we need the word art? But it is actually an art form. Can I take this over here? Is that okay? Will it reach? Okay, let's first get the power. That's okay. Excellent, thank you. And we'll see what happens. Anyway, these are just uh, some bits that I'm really proud of. This has now become a textbook. Again, UML, Advanced Software Engineering. And these are all other books uh, that I have uh, written in the past. This is becoming very popular. Dr. Tushar Hazra and I wrote it, Enterprise Architecture. Because everything is digital, digital, you know, digital transformation. Uh, this one was with Pete Sheringham, who is a Australian consultant in Ernst & Young. And he's a good uh, friend of mine as well. <coughs> and you can see I have put a lot of, this was a while ago, 10 years ago, and now suddenly it has become important. Because we have a chapter in that one, Green City. You have. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we have to now make that into a journal paper as well. So yeah, Green <coughs> ICT. Then I wrote on Green IT Metrics. Uh, then this was a report on environmentally responsible business strategy. It's a cutter, cutter report. Then I am writing a bit of Agile, and this is the last one, the, the 25th one, with Professor Tad. He came for a month from Japan. He works in Sofia University to Florida, and he said, let's finish this book. I need to go in a month's time. Then COVID lockdown happened. Mm -hmm. So I had a friend in my home for four months. <laughs> Just fun. We finished the book faster. And you work in progress. Uh, Professor Bhattacharji, Anul, he and I are working on digital transformation. Uh, Steve Blass and I are working on business analysis, IIBA's work. See, I, because I became a CBAP and then they said, do this. And this is my own personal work that I'm supposed to have finished by now. Some work on NSF grant related to environmental sustainability. And this is the second one. I'm going to talk about it once I take you through other material. This is the work that is happening in Western Sydney University right now. Let me see if I can. No, I should not stretch this further. Okay, this is all political stuff, but other areas <coughs> of research uh, are also of interest in case you are involved in any of these, including cloud, which is cloud native architectures are becoming uh, very, very popular. Okay. Now I've got about three or four slides which you can easily get uh, by going to, uh, by Googling. Uh, but this is United Nations initiative. And I find it very interesting, sustainable development. So they are correlating almost everything to sustainable development. And the word sustainable is much broader or uh, uh, covers a lot more than simply carbon footprint. And funnily, I was presenting some of this material to a group of uh, you know, fellow, fellow students. So those who are not students, who have graduated 10 years ago and have come for a refresher course. So these are experienced people. 
and I was presenting to them and someone started talking about correlating carbon footprint to happiness. And I said, look, I've got only 10 more years of thinking time left. So I don't think I can solve it in 10 years. You know, I mean, how do you, how do you correlate happiness to carbon footprint? Maybe, maybe not. I need my coffee. You need your coffee, you know. So these are, has, have any one of you come across these? You have, okay. Our university makes a big deal of these. Okay, excellent. Because so does the Western Sydney University. So these are okay. Um, another interesting thing, which we will talk in the actual Rotary a little later, but Rotary is a global organization doing social work. And they had, it was established in 1906. And up until last two years, three years ago, they had six areas of focus. Three years ago, so after 1906, 1906, three years ago, they added a seventh area of focus. So they had basic education and literacy, child health and maternal health, peace and conflict resolution, water and sanitation, economic and community development, and disease prevention. This is what it was for 100 plus years. And now they have added supporting the environment and one wonders why. And the reason in my understanding is that the next generation, which includes most of you, are more concerned about the environment than my generation. Because in a way you're going to live, not in a way, you are going to live more than me. So the earth that you inherit is important to you. And a lot more uh, business industry activities have been happening. So I hope you are following the news on what happened with AGL. What right? AGL? AGL was supposed to be the, uh, what is it called, the technical term? They were going to Take break the, the yes. And then the wonderful Atlassian CEO, who is a techie, techie, techie programmer at heart, came along and said, no, you will not be marginalized, whatever it is called. So it was a influence of a younger generation with billions of dollars to when spend. They were going to do the carbon unfriendly yes. spin-off and the carbon friendly <laughs> one. Yeah, I see. They're going to split the company into two. The, because right now, most energy in New South Wales and Victoria is still coal uh, powered. And you know that the earlier, the opening, uh, uh, thing I showed you, diesel, you know, somebody, uh, you know, diesel guzzling vehicle. It's so funny, I shouldn't say funny, it is so interesting that in New South Wales we use black coal and in Victoria we use brown coal. And for you and me, I mean, look at all this, it makes no difference, brown coal, black coal, any coal. But brown coal pollutes a lot more than black coal. So there is someone who is a techie genius who has created Jira. Jira was his first product from Atlassian. Now it's a whole, I mean, I have used Jira in Agile and so many other uh, situations. And now we're saying it's the time for somebody to look seriously at the environment. So social organizations, government organizations, businesses, everybody is looking at the environment. And so are you and I. So I won't take you, I won't read all this because you guys know about it. Uh, but it has, a, it's now really a big moment. And Australia seems to be leading that movement in, in one, one sense. I found this also very interesting. Without any, com without any criticism of what you eat and I eat, I am here. <laughs> I'm a pure vegetarian guy. <laughs> so I'm a lentil guy with a little bit of milk. Uh, but you can see that it came to me as a surprise and I haven't picked it from a you know published journal article, but I, I, I think there is a value in considering how food is made. There's also a movement of save the soil because apparently there is only 40 to 50 years of uh, productive soil left for us. These are fascinating topics because they are affecting all of us. And if, even if we make a small contribution towards it, it is worth it. 
So what do we really mean when we say environmental? I have a, I have a question. So the, the biggest yes. figure was showing something like distance in kilometers. How is that related to it? So the amount of carbon that this vehicle will produce in driving 10 kilometers is equivalent to, you know, somebody consuming one of these food items. Yes, sir. How do you, how do you get 10, kilo, 10 kilos of carbon dioxide out of one kilo of beef? <laughs> this is where I say good question. I have the cow, right? <laughs> <laughs> the very fact that we are having a chat around it is enough because as I already said I did not pick it up from a uh, you know a, a research journal where I could read the entire paper but I wanted to have this chat because we can live our life without realizing that what we are doing in our daily activities has an impact on the environment for example I think which university now but maybe it was UW or Sydney University, some student mechanical engineering came up with a gadget. You know how in the morning we start the shower and in my case I have to wait till it is really hot. And that, I am not able to measure how many liters I have wasted because that was cold water. And he put in a gadget there which will make sure that the first drop of water that comes out will be the right temperature. And that way we have not wasted that much of water. I mean, what about harvesting uh, water from the rooftops? I mean, this is a <coughs> interesting concept. Now, m most councils, at least in my council, Hornsby Council, you have to have a rainwater tank. So that was the idea, to encourage a bit of a chat. But I, if you give me, if you challenge me on any statistics, I will say, yes, good question. <laughs> So, what do we really mean by environmental intelligence? I'm doing a fair bit of work in AI and big data I've been doing for a while now. But the more data we collect, the more opportunity we have to make sense of the data. And this is a very carefully <coughs> made statement. It doesn't mean more data means more insights. It means more opportunity for insights. And uh, environment is something that can benefit with analytics. So when I apply AI to the environmental challenge, I call it environmental intelligence. So that's really, okay. So data science, this is where all the data <coughs> right now, the world's, you know, I don't know. There are terms like uh, zettabytes and uh, um, brontobytes. So we know up to tera and then petabytes. So you know one flight, one A380 from Sydney to LA will generate a petabyte or a Boeing will generate a petabyte which is a thousand terabyte and the terabyte is thousand gigabyte. So it's going to generate thousand thousand, it's a million gigabytes one flight. Of data. Of data, of data. I mean, this is the caveat, you know. Very, very sadly, I was in Kuala Lumpur, in Malaysia, when the flight uh, uh, vanished. There's a Malaysian Airlines flight that has vanished. <coughs> and even now, Australia put in a lot of effort. Uh, Tony Abbott was the prime minister at that time. And we were, like, using all kinds of technologies to help locate, and we couldn't. And still, this... Uh, this flight is generating, well, not one pita, but quite a few hundreds of uh, terabytes of data. The IoT sensors on the engines? On the engines and, um, yeah, fuel. Uh, I mean, one, I've got a Air India captain who comes here, a young friend of mine, and he's taking his flight from Delhi to bring it to Sydney. And, and he says that if there is a one degree change in the external temperature, that has an impact on how much fuel he should have in his wings. So you talk about data, all, all kinds of data is there. But this is my important statement that business people really don't care. They are saying, what is the value? And that's what you and I are also <coughs> saying. So these are all different 
terms which you are probably familiar with but machine learning is using python or r to make sense of big data because this data is so big that we need iterative executions of machine learning therefore we call it computer is learning through execution so there was a time when we wrote code in java or c++ compile link build execute now we cannot do that because it is not sufficient so we need language is scripting javascript will also help excel also helps in a small extent i mean you can do linear regression we can do you know okay yeah. standard deviation is pretty standard uh, and then the packages that come about so i have very little idea about statistical techniques but now i'm becoming familiar and learning and of course mm -hmm. they are needed as a part of ai so there is a lot more a uh, lot more over there and what do we really mean by artificial intelligence there are questions like is uh, are our computers going to take over humans which are good questions to discuss after the third beer in a very nice pub overlooking uh, wollongong bay because it is, yeah just pull the plug man <laughs> okay so artificial according to professor tad and taken from his book what he is saying is even these activities are artificial in the strictest sense of the word and these are natural so we have even talked about a balance between ai and ni natural intelligence in crucial decision making especially in the medical field with you know professor miller here there are so many decisions that are um, you know heavily influenced by ethics and morality and you know for example euthanasia it's a big debate all around the world so ai on its own is not going to uh, provide conclusive decision making yes if you are driving a tesla and uh, you just press the button take me to building 6 uw tesla will bring me here but even there there are caveats like people do fun things like uh, somebody stood there with a banner saying man walking and tesla slowed down somebody was just standing there with a piece of paper written man walking and the the onboard computer translated that as a man walking and it stopped <laughs> so okay here is a trivia again uh, how big is this huge big data this was a uh, way back in 1956 with a high drive or a high drive or floppy drive Th this is <laughs> floppy uh, floppy was actually quite an advanced uh, thing you know so it really is 5 megabyte massive 5 megabyte and the reason to show this to you is there is no uh, cut off uh, point where you can say above 1 petabyte is big data below 1 petabyte is not big data no the idea is can we make sense of it so the size of the data becomes less important the ability to find patterns in it is more important and that's really what i am trying to highlight of course this is another <laughs> trivia bit <laughs> that, that 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 was the that, there was an interesting statement there is a world market for four pcs <laughs> of course the statement I, I, was by I, I, ibm <laughs> in the i have preserved some floppies i have worked on eight and a half inch floppies but i am left with now uh, the uh, one uh, like quart uh, three inch flop the, the, the small the floppies that are not floppies that are not floppies yeah, yeah. well said 1.44 1.44 mb so <coughs> four things characterize data and when we talk about ai we are looking at these characteristics in environmental data data that is collected by sensors on the back of government buses data that is collected by sending drones in the farms data that is collected by reading the power bills of companies and so on in fact here we have got um, three types in australia we have got three types of uh, carbon 
data. I will show that to you. Inverse is our method of reporting that. But high volume, which is descriptive analytics, you know, the weather pattern in last 100 years stored in a database is high, vol uh, high volume, yes. Then high velocity. So I take my phone and I drive from Sydney to Bulongong. Uh, Google now knows that Bhuvan was driving and it was a velocity, there, there is some velocity with, uh, to it. And, and then if there are 10,000 people driving, that's current data. So that's pumping into a database which wants to do analytics. And it's not just text data or numeric data. We have blogs, we have newspaper reports, we have customer feedbacks, and now we have audio and video and graphics. So it's a very rich set of data. And finally, it may be all rubbish. <laughs> so veracity means that data has embedded spikes and troughs, which you and I as researchers have to identify and eventually it will lead to V4 value. So this is uh, okay, defining green IT, then uh, defining EI. So it is the sourcing, because from where are we getting this data? Are we going to, you know, is the, is the data provider providing us with the API, or it is, the data provider is a government uh, entity which is saying no APIs, just take the data and do whatever you want to with it. And use of data. When a organization holistically tries to make sense of data, and uh, there are organizations that are simply data vendors, there are associations. Have any one of you gone to Kaggle, kaggle.com? I highly recommend. In fact, when I give exercises to my uh, senior students, I ask them to go to Kaggle.com and download the database they want. There are thousands of databases over there. <laughs> we do uh, deal with the organization, the enterprise architectures in order to implement a ERBS. And this is of course another view of that definition. Uh, she is my only PhD student from India, but finished uh, again six, seven years back. And uh, this is, uh, so now she's doing work related to COVID as well. And uh, this is the, the tip where we reach what I'm calling environmental intelligence. So uh, developing a strategy and dealing with the organization as a whole. In, in any EI application, we will have uh, three parts. Uh, so how much of coverage that solution or that analytics is providing, uh, the duration, how long or how fast. There are times when action has to be taken on a literally very, very fine granular. We have a window of action of literally a few minutes in certain situations. And uh, so the duration becomes important and the intensity, which is how many times we have to iterate uh, a particular AI application for decision making. Another view of uh, EI, that is AI application to uh, environmental challenges, this, we have looked at four layers or four uh, steps, if you like. It starts with data, then at the organizational level, then, and I'm going to give show this to you as an example of SMEs, and then finally a overall carbon efficient society. So there's a lot of material. As I said, I wanted to show it all to you then depend on what piques your interest, we will have a chat later. This is work by Graham Philipson. Um, now I have stopped working him, but with him, but we used to work together. And uh, so we created a matrix of what we really mean by uh, a AI or data applications to the environment. And so the overall matrix was equipment, end user, enterprise data center, which is no longer uh, becoming um, or this is the cloud part of, uh, uh, of data storage because you know there was a time when Woolworths and uh, Westpac used to be proudly boasting we've got 1,000 programmers. Like what is a bank doing with a thousand programmers or a grocery store doing with a thousand programmers, IT people. 
so that's gone now it has gone to the to the cloud uh, but that used to be important and may still be important um, uh, if there are you know centralized data processing units and then utilization of it as a low carbon enabler and then look at the background the second part of the matrix attitude policies practices the technologies being used and the metrics which are still not matured in my opinion so this is a review <coughs> of uh, erbs environmentally responsible business strategy and uh, the way we worked out is so this was done a few years back but it takes between five to eight years for an organization to say mm -hmm. you know we are now fully carbon uh, or, or fully responsible environmentally responsible i don't think any organization can claim that right now there are next five or six slides i'm again going to show you the data that we had collected more than six years ago but if any one of you have any interest this is the kind of data we will be needing to uh, develop um, you know, metric support calculation support for erbs it was interesting that uh, for most part the survey that we did uh, led us to a conclusion that businesses are not interested in environment as such businesses are interested in it only if a there is a value in increasing their uh, uh, returns or there is a uh, penalty a government threat of penalty only those two parameters seem to be strongly motivating businesses at least in the work we did six years back so you can see government rules customer demands pressure from society and self-initiation this was the factors influencing green it at, at that time this was actually much earlier but we had done uh, we had updated our data and we had done some analytics uh, but this is to give you an idea okay drivers for carbon reduction environmental policy goals this is fairly interesting uh, data that you may find interesting to further the work because we need new data collection uh, but the 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 structure of the re, uh, research is still valid then we had worked on the processes because there are organizations that will come to us as and and say okay dr unhelkar you have done a great job we are happy with what you are trying to convince us now tell us how to go about it and so that now then i cannot wear a professorial hat then i have to wear a consulting hat and tell mm -hmm. the business these are the steps you take to develop your policy you implement your policy these are the risks and these are the advantages and this is how much it will cost you so that's what these uh, slides are showing and we had worked out four major uh, areas or dimensions in developing a environment in fact this is true of any policy a business wants to develop but if it is a bank it's a hospital it's a small manufacturing unit it's a airline then it is going to need these four money technology processes and uh, you know change of mindset people and there is a lot of material on this uh, that i have written okay erbs erbs okay any thoughts comments questions i have another 10 minutes then we can have more discussion so i mentioned to you engers which is our australia has been a pioneer in this and of the six greenhouse gases or all six greenhouse gases we categorize them into scope one scope two and scope three for um, just like the tax returns in australia we have to also file large businesses have to file carbon returns and those carbon returns were based on these three scopes so i think i have defined them okay no so 
so this is where you know i drive a car and i produce carbon and it gets calculated i have a business a small manufacturing unit i'm, I'm manufacturing uh, you know whatever lawn mowers and i'm producing carbon scope 2 is where that original thesis of mine you know i am burning a diesel i feel dirty somebody else is you know producing diesel uh, using uh, whatever to to produce the electricity and i'm driving my car i feel clean so that's scope 2 and then um, uh, in uh, procurement or you know scope 3 is indirect this is direct this is indirect and this is even more indirect and again all this uh, material has been officially uh, provided by our government and then some others uh, tried to use that so when ei we are talking about ei we are talking about data there is a phenomenal opportunity to figure out how much of carbon zoom has produced in the last 2 years because zoom has been the most popular online tool of course in the university i am using a canvas as a uh, teaching learning platform and uh, i am using uh, teams for my students but if, if there are so many uni uh, western sydney university is entirely zoom so the, you know the the stock market has also gone up for zoom and the carbon emissions have also gone up but nobody has really bothered nuclear webex okay so there you go <laughs> okay so uh, this was a uh, account workbook that was provided by our government to large businesses i think 500 kilotons or something there was a break up uh, break off point beyond which reporting was made necessary and depending on your interest there is a um, iso standard that the whole series of standards actually starting with 14001 that deals with uh, ems environmental management systems and uh, i had done some work i was hoping this will become the currency symbol for <laughs> carbon like you know bitcoins have become b dollar dollar i shouldn't mention bitcoins here right i should not mention bitcoins at all now, i was i have not invested and many of my friends my rich friends when they asked my advice i thought about it in front of them and i said I don't think you should. Actually, I had given no thought to it. I just knew it that this will not work. And just two weeks back, they were saying that was a great advice. So, <laughs> so back to the field. And generally, you know, static and dynamic measures become important in our systems. Okay, lean to green. I've done a fair bit of work there. Um, again, this is storytelling that. Uh, mm -hmm these pictures were like unimaginable in our lifetime and they have happened similarly in LA in fact even more unimaginable and then someone was reporting on Kathmandu and uh, saying how clear and it that's is. Everest over there that's Everest over there someone from uh, Patiala in yeah. Punjab, my friend yeah. says, oh, Bhuvanji, you we can see, see we can see. I said, uh, yeah, now let's try and keep it like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, this is a, uh, uh, this is a research-based statement, which says that, uh, you know, people never thought that governments will act so swiftly in the interest of the uh, population. Um, you know, most of the governments, most of the times don't. <coughs> but has the recovery had a green focus the general feeling is no so there was a uh, there's a minor caveat to that previous slide, please sir which is that governments did prioritize humanity ahead of economies but then they lost governments <laughs> people lost elections <laughs> on account of having done very so. very well said i i agree with you and, and I, I, I mean that's his, that's that person's view of the world, right? That I think economic should be in front of people. But that's not necessarily the view of, that's not necessarily the widespread view of the world. Yeah, but uh, what... No, he's saying academic... humanity ahead of economics. Sorry? He's saying people ahead of economics. 
he's making a statement about this Gail Whiteman person. That's it's almost the impossible to believe yeah. that they put humanity yeah. in front of yeah. economics. I mean, there's plenty of examples where they have put humanity in front of economics. No, no, including Australia. Yeah. No, no. But why, why would this person say that as her expectation that this is the way governments would act if they did the opposite? My point is, from what I know about history and stuff, is that they would they would put humanity in front of economics, and they did, which is not like it's impossible to believe. It's in fact the way it's the people who are saying put economics in front of people who are the impossible to believe ones. That that, that would be my assertion. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And okay, uh, there is a fair. Uh, so I have done some literature review right now which I find quite fascinating in which there were even papers published which were saying that uh, if we don't have enough carbon particles in the air then the, the heat of the sun you know as it comes in doesn't get reflected and <laughs> therefore we have potential for higher temperature which I found rather interesting. I will only say interesting <laughs> but you know in academia we have the freedom to think crazy and I have no problems with that. The challenge, of course, is how much of proof, how much of validation can we offer? You know, in any research paper we write, we have to have a section on methodology. And that means we have to prove that our statement, whatever it might be, is actually based on some scientific uh, methodology, which reminds me, I think I send you, or if not, I will send to everyone through Aditya. Professor Ghosh, <laughs> I'll send. In Australia, we can say first name. In America, we cannot say first name. You know, I'm always Professor Unhelker, which is kind of interesting. So um, I just created a short 15 minutes video on writing a research paper. So most of the time we are working hard to do the research. And then when it comes to writing, it can become challenging. And uh, I just created something uh, that I'll share with all of you. But uh, there a definite section on methodology. So we have to <laughs> prove whatever hypothesis uh, we have. So there's an interesting question. What is the average carbon footprint of the exercise of writing a paper? <laughs> and if we use that, then should we shut down certain kinds of paper writing? <laughs> <laughs> sweet, sweet, sweet. <laughs> What's a sheet of paper for? No, no, we're not printing. Yeah? We saw paperless, but that's fine. <laughs> paperless also turned out to be a very interesting uh, uh, thesis that we thought that we are saving paper, uh, but that saving did not turn out to be as good as uh, we thought it would be. Also, I mean, my, my home here in Sydney, my entire family is ferociously green. That means I cannot throw a small uh, piece of plastic in rubbish it has to be put in recycling which is fine but my home in florida i just received a message a week ago my town sarasota bradenton has scrapped recycling i have to return the recycling bins which means that it's not that they will not recycle they are claiming that they have got analytics to, to sort separate, yeah. yeah to sort so i don't know what's going to happen Here's some more data on airlines <laughs> and so on and carbon. So now I have got literally another uh, five, seven minutes to just take you through what I'm doing right now. So I'm here because I am on a sabbatical. And in my university, every six years, we have an opportunity to go on sabbatical. And uh, so I came here and I've been working on that uh, Psychology of Agile book. Uh, we have already submitted. We published one with Dr. Mukesh Prasad, one paper on RFID, UTS. Another one is almost, uh, well, it has been submitted, but we don't know what the result will be. And uh, then this is the work going on right now. Data collection is going on at uh, Western Sydney Uni. So Professor Yi Chen Lan, Dr. Laurel Jackson, and Ms. Kanwal Bashi, we are all working together. And you are all welcome to join in any way you feel like. So that's Dr. Laurel Jackson, Professor Yi Chen, and this was a bunch of students. I gave a guest uh, talk, and then there were many who were online, like we have some here. 
and uh, we had a bit of an interesting chat around uh, environment. So what is it that we are doing? Uh, we are trying to create a framework, which I'm totally not a great word to use because everybody is coming up with a framework, but it is still a framework. So we will also say it's a framework that will specifically be usable by SMEs in their environmental journey. And this framework is aligned to, okay, our goal. So why do we need a framework that is specific to SMEs? This is one more of uh, uh, U, U, uh, WSU, Western Sydney University's alignment. So Resilient Cities, Climate Action, Partnerships and Economic Transitions out of the many goals. But we have two parts to our work that we, we have started, in fact, late last year, before I even came here. So the first phase is to identify and investigate the barriers to SME's green effort. So most environmental intelligence activities are conducted by large organizations. A Qantas or a Westpac, it is easier to do so because it also provides them lot of good marketing material that we are green they have the budgets they have the resources they have the know-how so they can do it and they should and we compliment them for that they have an explicit strategy for using csr for advertising for advertisement and that, that has received a bit Which of is a very flag. cynical yeah. <laughs> very yeah it has received flag absolutely so no, the the coffee shop that we went to just now or the, the, the restaurants or yes or or the barber shop that I don't go to for last two years this is a two-year-old product by the way and we have a bit of a competition in my university every other professor is trying to grow a beard and mine is just shot and they said what have you done and I said uh, ammonia nitrate ammonia nitrate and my wife hates it I mean any wife would hate she said don't come to Australia I've called immigration. I've told them, check his passport. I mean, I look, I look like my son, clean, shaved, and smart in the passport. And she says, you will never be able to get in. And I stand in front of, it was 19th of January, and I stood in front of the gate, and I inserted my chip-enabled passport, and within three seconds, it says, welcome to Australia. <laughs> because it only checked from here to here. <laughs> so, those small businesses might have something good in their heart but they have no idea how to go about it you talk to really talk to a barber talk to a beautician talk to all the small shops in westfield and you will find that they don't know what to do if you ask them what's your carbon footprint they will look at you and i could be one of them because i mean what are you talking i'm selling uh, you know shirts and uh, jumpers and uh, birthday greeting cards and balloons and that's all I know what what do you mean carbon footprint so it's an interesting thing that at times 70 percent this is not again too validated but at times a large percentage of carbon is emitted by a large collection of small businesses but we only focus on large businesses because it is easier to do so. So our research is focusing on a collection of small businesses. And we are starting by asking them a question, do you know what's your carbon footprint? And the most likely answer, like it's a survey in many countries actually, I'll show you, oh here they are. So Australia, of course, we have reached out to the SME Association in New South Wales with 600 members. I mean, if we get, 100 responses across Australia, we will be very happy. But we, we, let us see what happens. In Vietnam, because Professor Lan, Yi Chen Lan is now the, uh, uh, the president or the whatever chair, chair of the Vietnam campus of Western Sydney University. And he's a provost here as well, looking after global businesses. Uh, there are people in Taiwan and uh, there are students in Philippines who are helping us collect data. Uh, and of course, India. I mean, I have gone around, we, we have talked to many people who are representing SMEs. And in India, the numbers are like thousands of SMEs in that association. And we are again 
if from each of these places we get 100 solid data, then our research will have really done well, data collection wise. And then we will be analyzing it. And then we plan in phase two, which may happen sometime late this year or early next year, there'll be in-depth uh, case study and then validation of what we call our framework. And these are the research questions, which again will be modified as we progress. What are the factors that impact SME's initiative? They are really saying don't add any more costs to the already the cost that we are having. So really, if we are saying, you know, here is a app. <laughs> I mean, my friend Josh Baker, my past management student, another friend in India, and I, we have we have we have a startup. It's called Eco Plus. It's an app, and you take that app and you go to the coffee store and you say, I want a cappuccino, but here is my ceramic cup. Now, all the youngsters will say, why should I do it? You should ask the question, why should I do it? You, you will say, I am a generation that will do something if I get something back, which is fair enough. So I'll give you 10 points. And you do, you know, five times you go ceramic cup, sixth time the coffee cup is free. The coffee is free. Those, it's called gamification. And we are trying to see if SMEs would participate in gamification. Because now they have a investment. We are saying, look, youngsters will come to you if you offer sixth cup free and you are saving, I mean, that coffee cup is not recyclable. Even though it may appear to be made up of uh, uh, non-plastic non material, but there is a certain amount of plastic in there, whatever it is, it's non non-recyclable. So it costs money. So if you have a $4, if you pay $4 for coffee, maybe 50 cents plus, and we are trying to encourage or thinking in that direction, that SMA will say, if I save 50 cent on every cup of coffee or whatever, a dollar on every cup of coffee, and I get more people to come in, maybe sixth or maybe 10th cup, it's worth offering free. So now you go everywhere, including that barber shop, you know, third visit, three visits and the fourth visit is free or fourth visit is half price. I mean, in America, everything is like coupons, 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 you know, there is a company, called Groupon, coupon. called <laughs> just selling coupons, you know. So that is what we are thinking. Unlike go to Westpac and say, you know, if you, if your carbon is more than 500 kilotons, you will be fined um, half a million dollars then Westpac will immediately act because it makes perfect sense to the accountants and to the lawyers. But talk to a barber or a beautician or a you know clothes uh, a fashion shop, it will not make sense. So we are trying to gamify. Which evaluation criteria are suitable in measuring environment footprint? Do we go to their power bill, which appears to be the main place right now? Or what else can we do? how to develop this transformation roadmap, including measurement. We want a capability maturity model for the environment. So environmental maturity model, EMM, and we will try and apply that into SMEs. And then associations of SMEs are much better place to pitch this than individual SMEs. This is our theoretical contribution to advance the understanding of SME's challenges, the usefulness and acceptance of the evaluation criteria for their maturity, and the publications of the models that will hopefully increase uh, more participation. Practical, I already mentioned to you that app, but something similar to gamify, um, produce a roadmap, and uh, yeah, this is what the app is about. And uh, recommendations to help SMEs improve their performance. So this is what I had planned to talk. And so this is my conclusion that really business doesn't really care. Honestly, all our studies are saying business is business. So long as there is a stock market, there cannot be a altruistic motive at heart. But then someone like 
Atlassian's uh, CEO comes along and changes AGL's uh, uh, demarginalization, whatever it is. Please visit Kaggle, I like it. Here are more references. Uh, this kid is far too cute to be me. I'm not even a fraction, but I just Googled uh, thank you and this came up and I thought it's looking cool. That's my email. There is also a university email address. I invite you to join me on uh, LinkedIn. And Professor Aditya Ghosh, sir, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, everybody, for listening to me. Thank you. I'm going to start out. Yes, sir. Please. I've, I've, I've been itching to ask this question. <laughs> yes. um, so, the green imperative is fundamentally anti-business. Whether it's a small business or a large business, if you go to Qantas and say, um, you know, you need to be green. For me, Qantas being green means Qantas stops flying. Wow. <laughs> if I go to your barber and say, you need to be green, for me that would mean, there's a, there's a non-trivial carbon footprint involved in shaving your beard and because you're so much. You have to switch on first uh, Lawn mower. electrical <laughs> <laughs> clipper and get rid of the first bit and then maybe do manual shaving and Thank you, Paul Pierce. <laughs> right. Yeah. And what about the carbon footprint of making the scissors? It's a hard to tell. No, no, there's a carbon footprint as well. <laughs> so, <clears throat> taking that argument to the limit, to be really green, we all collectively as humanity need to stop doing things. If none of us did anything, our carbon footprints would be as close to zero as possible. But that doesn't sit well with anybody, right? Nobody will say, you know, okay, I'm being green because I do nothing, I sit at home. I don't switch on the AC, I don't switch on the light, I just sit on my bed and let's it's forget even, the fact that somebody made the bed. It's even more fundamental than that. Mm. If you look at the Antarctic records of carbon dioxide, mm. the carbon dioxide levels in the Antarctic um, ice started rising 8, 7,000, 8,000 years ago when we started in agriculture. <coughs> right? mm. so we, we, the, the, the cycle was heading down for, a, mm. for an ice age mm. and uh, the carbon, the carbon went it like this. Avoided the ice age. Yeah, and it's only right. in the last little bit that it started to trend up. Right? <coughs> Um, and the fact of the matter is, we don't have a carbon footprint which is sustainable. That's the problem. We are, we are, we are. Uh, my personal view is we are an extinct species and we just don't know it yet. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and from what we've heard today, right? Mm -hmm. You open up your computer. That's the problem. Number one, you, you catch a bus to work. That's the problem. You wear anything but natural materials. That's the problem. Right? Which one of these things are you going to stop? And the answer is none of them. You're not going to put your phone away. You know, that, that's the fundamental problem with this carbon thing. We don't need carbon neutrality. We need carbon negativity of a level that people will not put up with. Which is actually yeah. not practical. Yeah. We, don't need air, we don't need airlines. Yeah. Right? We don't need yeah. public transport. All those things have to go. Professor Hilker burnt a bunch of fuel to get here. And so the green argument says, why don't you just do it on WebEx? But the mm -hmm. argument from me would be, that's not the same thing. The face-to-face -face interaction counts for something. Mm. Right. So then that raises the question that, you know, to be truly green, humanity faces a fundamental rethink. <clears throat> from, from ground up, we should be questioning every single activity that we engage in and ask the question, is it really necessary? which takes us into philosophical territory. What is a human being supposed to do in a human being's lifetime? I mean, every human being could be born and live as a mass of tissue and just sustain itself, but does, but that has a carbon footprint. So should we even live as a mass of tissue or should we, you know, so what your, ourselves right after what your, what your, uh, what your argument is leading to mm. in a philosophical sense, mm. if I was not here, I would not have a carbon footprint. Correct. So save the planet. Stop. If you living. were never born, I was. If I was never born, so many things would have been avoided. <laughs> Correct. Including the beard. <laughs> so so on a more. So the question is a difficult question, but that doesn't mean we don't 
explore it further. So, so the worry for me is that we are playing at the edges. All of the stuff we're doing and we can look at the contrasts of the world or even your barber should the barber sign up with your SME model, right? Um, we're all going to be fiddling at the edges and we'll all feel good about it but the reality is that who knows if we're really making difference to <coughs> well, the glaciers breaking off in Antarctica. This, this is a biological system, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And fundamentally, all biological systems rely on negative feedback. Right? And, the feed, and it, works as a negative, it works as negative feedback until such time as the damage to the system exceeds the uh, functional capacity of the system. The sustained damage. Right? After which, it becomes a positive feedback. Right? That's so in, in, if, you, if you have a damaged heart, there are mechanisms involved with, with damaged hearts that mean you don't go into heart failure. Okay? The major one is that the heart actually expands a bit, a bit, a bit larger so that the contraction then is a, bit, is a bit better, but more like what is normal because the heart is damaged, such that you don't go into heart failure. The problem is that this, and this, this relates to, to muscles, you know, when you have your arm like this, that's the mas maximum muscle Flexion power, power yeah. right? But if you extend it like this or like this, in fact, the power contraction is less. So as the heart expands, it, it, it's basically doing this kind of thing. So once it passes 90 degrees, now its power has reduced. So you've now expanded your heart past its maximum contraction potential into a minor contraction potential. So what happens then is the heart goes, Oh, I can't. I'm not producing enough. How do I get over this? I retain more fluid and I stretch the heart some more. At which point it becomes weaker. Mm -hmm. Stretch the heart becomes more weak, more weak, more weak, and now the person is in heart failure. So the way you get around that is you give them something to make them pee fluid out to make the heart smaller, and you get back to the point where you've got a got a better better contraction. So in a biological system like we have, the fact that we are seeing the damage means we're done. <laughs> right, and we can and we can do stuff around the edges, and it'll make things it'll ameliorate things. It's like COVID, you know, everything went down by thirty percent. But as you had it down there, was we needed fifty or sixty percent. Right, so if everyone staying at home mm -hmm. gets us down to thirty percent, what do we have to do to get to sixty percent? <laughs> only only go grocery shopping and nothing else. Yeah. No, but, but then uh, there's a trade-off between lean and then portions and mental health. Are other things will come with that. So like if Professor Medo Yeah, but remember, yeah, if, we, if, we, if we prioritize being green as the top priority, then health disappears, right? Yeah. Andrew doesn't have a job yeah. anymore because nobody cares about being alive. <laughs> <laughs> because nobody cares about being alive because it's greener to be dead than to be alive. Ah, there's your slogan. <laughs> <laughs> I've got one for you. <laughs> no health care, let them die. I don't think it's about doing nothing. It's about, so we have this target where they go, if we have this much rise in temperatures, we're leading to a catastrophic event essentially happening. Uh, so we can do something about it now. So we can just say, <coughs> listen, we're all done. Like, this is going to happen inevitably and just accept our fates and do nothing about it keep making lots of money, uh, businesses um, doing what but they do. But let's face it, I mean, think, think about what Australia has done. It's in the process of uh, taking away the livelihoods of thousands of miners, right? And will the taking away of the livelihoods of these thousands of miners actually prevent a single Antarctic glacier from breaking off? You, you can, I don't think so. You can reason about perfectionism and say, well, you know, what's the point of doing anything if it's not perfect, it's not gonna work. No, no, it's not about but, perfection, it's about... But, but the problem is, the problem with that is, say. the problem with that is, um, so I've got, a, I've got a, a friend and I said to her, who was concerned about environmental things, you know, the, the plants getting one, I said, listen, you and I have got the, got, the, got the salary to buy a block of land near where you live, near Canberra, and to plant trees on it. Let's make, let's make that our initiative, right? And he said, What's the point of that? That won't make any difference. Yeah. I said, well, then leave the government alone. 
constantly saying the government must do this, the government must do this. But you should I continue to record or should I stop the recording? <laughs> <laughs> this is becoming interesting. By the way, just for the record, I am I have recorded these wonderful, brilliant researches of Professor Aditya Ghosh over here, and I'm going to now stop the recording <laughs> so they can then say whatever they actually want to say. It's, 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 it's the, only, the only why, the only why we 